work is on uh, collaborating with space-related research institutes, government agencies, government agencies, and an artistic team to create a series of space-themed public event in Ireland in 2014. By uh, Shaw, Max Hunez, Miss O'Neill, Foley, Felan, Crowley, and their son, Colin and Baxter, Colin, Macaulay, Como. Oh, you had a bigger crew than we are. I know, it's so, Yeah, and um, so the talk is given by Liam Shaw. Yes, thanks very much. Thank you very much. Yeah, um, so yes, yeah, so I'm I'm Neve. Um, it's a strangely spelled name I'm because Neve. it's Irish. It's okay, it's fine. Nobody gets it. It's all right. It's only Irish people who know how to say that my name, so it's okay. Um, yeah. So um, I want to talk to you today about um, the year that I had last year, uh, 2014. Um, I'm based mainly in Dublin. I'm not actually from Dublin. I'm from Dundalk, which is above Dublin. And last year I was the artist in residence at uh, Blackrock Castle Observatory in Cork. So that was where I was based. And my background is, is quite strange. Um, I'm a fully qualified engineer. Um, I have two degrees in engineering and a PhD in science. And uh, I, there was always a creative part of me that needed to get out. So about 12 years ago, I realised that I was probably better at communicating than I was as a, a pure researcher. Researcher. So I embarked in a career in performance uh, for a number of years, uh, which went reasonably well. And um, But I missed the whole uh, science and engineering part of my brain. So I decided to pursue a career combining them initially first as a sort of a communicator where I would just go on radio and TV and you know talk about particular stories and topics which was interesting to a degree but then there was a whole other artistic part of that form of communication so in the last eight years I've been developing myself as somebody who I believe works in STEAM which is where the arts is um, is used as a means to communicate science technology engineering and maths and I put myself very much at the centre of the work that I make. Um, because my <coughs> biggest asset is performance, and unfortunately I can't draw or you know, uh, do all the beautiful things that pure artists can do, um, I usually uh, get up and speak in some shape or form. Um, so a lot of my work is performative or interview in nature. So uh, why am I telling you all this? Well, I want to give you the background to what happened uh, in 2014. So um, this is me. I was eight years of age, a uh, clunky little objective child, typical diary entry, it was all facts and I was obsessed with what time I went to bed at for some strange reason. And uh, I grew up in a house with lots of science and technology and, uh, and I saw this when I was about eight or nine years of age and from that moment on I have wanted to see that for myself and go to space. And then as a teenager I got lost with, uh, in the world of boys and my friends and I forgot. And while I was making my work in STEAM, I uh, was looking at other outcomes of my life. And one of them was the girl who at eight years of age wanted to be an astronaut and realised I'd done very little about it. And even though I may look 28, I'm actually in my 40s. So I decided uh, to do something about it And uh, four years ago. And so I started talking to people. And this is where the collaboration began uh, about... Uh, trying to make it happen or just investigating what happens to people who have impossible dreams. So I began to talk to Science Foundation Ireland. I began to talk to Blackrock Castle Observatory in Cork. I began to talk to the Arts Council of Ireland. And I proposed a project with a number of objectives. One that would be artistic for me, but also trying to think of another outcome um, for, pla for places like Science Foundation Ireland, which is our national funding authority. They're looking for something more tangible. So if we can find a way as artists of giving, of giving these funding agencies something that's of use to them, I think we might actually develop collaborations more successfully going forward, which is the purpose of what this talk is today. So I proposed a project with a number of objectives. Firstly, to see what happens when you collaborate directly with you know, government agencies like Science Foundation Ireland and you include um, Blackrock Castle Observatory, which would ultimately give me an association with the European Space Agency. H how does that work? And then artists like myself. Um, and really to just get conversations going about space exploration, because I find a lot of people, unless they're naturally obsessed with space, they don't really kind of seem to know what's going on. And I would love to just smash that nut if possible. Um, and doing so by putting 
science and particularly space exploration in new platforms, performative platforms, in theatre, in movies, in, in public events, in, in places that they don't necessarily think they're going to learn. And also to increase awareness of the massive input that Ireland is having in the space industry, which Irish people know very little about. And also to get people to change their perception of what science, technology, engineering and maths is for them on a personal level, to overcome that fear that some people have about maths and technology and science and engineering. So I did that and I created a number of events. The first one was my own personal journey called To Space, which was a theatre performance where I collaborated also with a number of artists together to create that. I'll talk about that in a while. I converted that, took out some of the sad stuff, you know, the fact that you're in your 40s and you still haven't realised your dream, um, for a teenage audience, because they don't get that, they think they're invincible. So uh, I converted it with a, with a message about them making sure that they don't make the mistake that I did and discover boys. And uh, thirdly, uh, a family show called My Place in Space, which was all about scale and our place in the universe, from the smallest thing to the biggest thing. Again, to create a fun and interactive event that all the family can get involved in. And then also um, to uh, interview people who have successfully made it uh, in a career in space, uh, in the space industry or in space science of some description, to inspire the next generation to see that there are loads of other types of careers out there than just like working in a lab or working in you know, uh, as an engineer in a, in a concrete, uh, you know, civil engineering capacity. And so that, at the very core of that was this collaboration and, and you know, none of us really knew how it was going to work. I just knew what I wanted to do and I just started having lots of conversations with people and I developed a network. And at the core was um, this place here, which is Blackrock Castle Observatory in Cork, when I was the artist in residence there. And they just gave me free reign to meet people or to put me in touch with people. And through them, I was introduced to a number of people at um, ESA in ESTEC, which is really where the project kind of took off. I met Lorraine, she's down there in the bottom left hand corner. She works in the communications office and she's very good to me. And um, people just helped me, people begot people. And I was on Skype with astronauts and asking them questions. And it just became six months of just conversations and visits and, and then from that, then I took that information and then I brought that to a very creative team um, with me at the helm coming with my idea of, you know, wanting to go to space and having this personal journey, uh, personal memoir, and then putting in a room with directors and dramaturgs and visual artists and people specialising in video projections and, and what can come out of that. And what came out of that, and we got Arts Council funding for that particular aspect as well, which was a lovely kind of a tick that there's that, that, that it is possible to get kind of, you know, like a government science foundation and, uh, you know, the government artists in you know, um, council to work together on something. And we created uh, Two Space, which was this show here, which premiered last year um, at the Tiger Fringe Festival, which is one of the big theatre festivals in Ireland. And um, we got a very, uh, we got a, a, a quite diverse mix of audience compared to most people who are at the Fringe Festival. We got people who have a natural interest in science and we got people who are naturally interested in arts and, and they both kind of met each other somewhere in the corridor and so they, they both learned something new from that experience. And it, was, and it was great for me and it was success and it continues to tour. Uh, we've toured it around Ireland and I just returned from Edinburgh uh, where there's a national kind of arts festival on there and we've got bookings and, and what's interesting is we're not only getting bookings for arts festivals, we're already getting bookings for science festivals. So it's, it's been very interesting that collaboration that you can cross over the two worlds and provide content for both. Um, this is a trailer for the, what time do I have? Do I have time to show this? Yeah. 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 This is a trailer for the um, for the uh, piece of theatre.
Said I converted that then to a schooled version of the show so and that that toured around Ireland and as part of the science week which is our national uh, week to celebrate science and also world space week which is happening again next week and and then also I'm not going to play this but that was just a little video that I interviewed people at ESTEC about what fascinated them about the universe and then also I made a family show called my place in space which again took some of that content uh, more about like you know uh, the numbers, the massive numbers, and trying to scale it up and scale it down to see um, how each family member, you know, from the smallest child to the to the oldest person, we had grannies and we had six day old babies in there, trying to figure out in terms of the scale of themselves in relation to the scale of the universe on the atomic and on the edges of the universe level. And uh, and again, that was very successful. And what's starting to happen is that when I get booked for uh, to do the theatre show, it's lovely that I can say, well, I can also give you, you know, um, a, a teenage school version, and I can also do like a family workshop, and that's very interesting for uh, the different, uh, you know, the different venues to to book because it gives them a variety of things. That's just a, a trailer for that particular show as well, which I won't play. We don't have time. Yeah, one minute. So um, this is literally the impact and reach that we had just in in 2014, and I've just been adding on to it in. 2015 that that basically this kind of work continues to grow and um, as I said that what I would probably say in terms of conclusions is that the one thing that I learned from making this is that throughout that collaboration and it was something that kind of came out in the last session as well is that if you can humanize something about science people are immediately engaged so for my work I put myself at the centre of it, but I believe going forward, every work I make doesn't have to be about me. We just have to make sure that it has to relate to the audience in some way. That I think it's really important for artists to collaborate in this world. Uh, we're kind of like you know, we're kind of like feathers blowing in the wind, and we wander, and we generally aren't kind of funded uh, full time at anything. So it's so it would be lovely to have some sort of support structure because I really do believe that we have a place in the government agencies and the research institutes to help discover things that maybe scientists and engineers have overlooked. And uh, I think it's also a very valuable tool to change people's perceptions of science, technology, engineering, and maths as well. Thank you for listening. So what is next? <laughs> That's a very good question. Well, this continues. Um, I've, I really want to uh, develop the artist in residence with the space industry, so that's what I'm trying to do. I'm working with a few satellite companies in the United States for another artist in residence program there. But I want to get up there and the artist in residence market. He's got. He's got. Yeah, he's got. He's got. Uh, I have a question. Yes. When you were interviewing the astronauts, were you? Did you have more? Um, Will to go, or did they tell, tell you about it in a way that you were um, that you yourself could experience something? Um, it made me more keen to go because I think people don't understand the huge uh, effect on the body, and I think that we as artists have a responsibility to try and humanize that for people. So it made me want to go even more, but it, but I realized the huge uh, effect it'll have on our bodies, though. You know, so. Thank you. So we bridge art and science, but we keep on time. And so the next uh, talk is uh, on art science of the space age toward the platform for art science collaboration at ESTEC. It's a talk which has been prepared 
uh, with Evelina Dunnich and uh, Dimitri Gelfand, but they are now in an, uh, uh, an art event in Berlin. But uh, we have also included uh, some uh, contribution from uh, Katarina and Natalie. Yes, so, um, so we are part of the Royal Academy of Arts and the Royal Conservatory uh, in The Hague, in the Netherlands. And um, we, um, this class was part of um, our, the, the institutions where we, work, where we study and ESTEC and um, Synergetica Lab, that is, um, the, um, is where uh, Evelina and Dimitri uh, work as, an arti as artists. And also, um, they also asked us to apologize because they are not here because they have a, um, some, um, they are presenting her, their work at Berlin. Um, so, um, we wanted to talk about the context a little bit of, um, of the collaboration between art and science. Um, so it actually started the, before the, um, the, the, the space age in Russia. Um, that came from cosmism. That uh, was a philosophical um, um, movement um, that that was uh, exploring the possibility of having art laboratories uh, orbiting around the Earth and going to space, um, and exploring the weightlessness. So, um, so they were exploring all the, all these possibilities because they uh, they knew that going to space was not just a dream, but that it would happen. They were sure that it would happen. And uh, we think it's, uh, so Evelina and Dimitri are presenting this because they are both Russian and they are uh, now the, um, evolving from this idea of cosmism, which as a philosophical movement involved all the arts. So you had uh, people who were active in theaters designing theater shows for space and how would a, um, how would a, a, a theater hall look like? And paint, uh, painters like Malevich doing uh, their inquiries, like really they were uh, art, uh, art scientists in the beginning of 20th century. And now I will talk about uh, Evelina and Dimitri's work because they are showing a couple of uh, their work and what they do. They are one of the founders of Synergetica Lab, Synergetica Lab which uh, is based in Amsterdam which la lays on the, on the intersection of uh, art and science. And so what's happening now, it's actually that all these ideas can be achieved because the, the, the technology and, and the science is, uh, can be put in the hands of artists that could use their creativity to use this. Um, so that actually that the, the imagination also of that movement can be realized and they are doing that now. So uh, they're uh, presenting two works here. One is Sun Levitation and the other one is Mucolation is Omniverse. And Sun Levitation, the piece from 2007, is actually uh, golden leaves, uh, really thin and light golden leaves suspended with uh, static uh, sonic waves. Uh, with And the other one, um, uh, Mucilaginous Omniverse, is, uh, uh, it is, what they did is they sonified the silicone oil, and this is this field, and with this sonification, on, uh, the droplets of the same, so the sonification of the field is going upwards, and they're uh, releasing the, 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 the droplets of silicone oil, the same substance, which is then being uh, suspended um, above the surface, and it actually creates, it is the, the largest particles that we can see that they're actually uh, acting upon the wave particle duality. They are, sh they, they are clustering and reacting as, as the low particles that would be otherwise be um, unobservable. Uh, also what happens um, when you are experiencing their art artworks 
is that you have this very strong feeling of how beautiful science is. And if you, if you make it, uh, if you put it in a context where you can express this, that to public, then you really capture them. And then you can really get very deep inside. This piece, Photonic Wind, from 2013, was also shown on this uh, Today's Art Festival that we participated in. And it is uh, a vacuum chamber with a, with a laser light and the particles of uh, diamond dust. And what happens in this little chamber is that the, the light is actually capturing the dust particles and spiraling them out and either making them suspended in light or actually, uh, um, how do you say that? Um, the yeah, counting them out. So, and it is, it is really an observable uh, phenomena, which is now, uh, they're mentioning that this uh, phenomena is what we consider to be the possible uh, way planets the are beginning formed. of forming the planets through, um, through light. And um, now for the, the end part of this presentation, we, are, uh, we would like to mention a couple of works that were created by the uh, students of our science with Evelina and Dimitri and Bernard. And because this program ran in 2003 and then in 2000, uh, 2013 and 2015, which is ASNA, Bernard will talk about the previous year and we will talk a bit about this year. Good, so that was uh, one of the projects for, that we ran uh, last year. So actually we had about 10 projects. This one is about exoplanet. And the inspiration from this artist, uh, Natella Lemonzaba, was the two uh, projects that you mentioned on exoplanet. Uh, so, so she put an uh, optical setup with lenses, and as uh, inspiration for what could be the texture of an exoplanet, she used uh, the, the cover of trees or a different uh, type of uh, vehicle you can find on Earth. And then you could have a show where uh, she would uh, manipulate to see the appearance of some of the structure in the, on, a, on a screen. You could also go around the installation. So you could see both the exoplanet as a result, but also the exoplanet as it's being uh, formed and, uh, by the creator. So we had also um, the Freedom, also the robotic lunar dome. So this was a, a, an installation where Ronald shelf out. Uh, he's an artist uh, who is very creative. One of his uh, other piece of work was uh, dismounting a car and displaying it all in a huge uh, room, and, uh, uh, but uh, doing that only with hands, and uh, uh, also documenting all the operation of uh, dismounting the car, including the transport of each of the parts into the exhibition area. So, so, and here, so that's another mechanical uh, setup, where he built a Freedom, which is uh, robotically uh, operated. That's a lunar Freedom. Uh, that's, uh, an allegory for a human robotic moon village, which is covered, of course, by a protecting uh, dome. And in this vision, uh, this dome was broken by a meteorite, and then human disappeared. You are only left with a robotic device still in operation. So he showed that in various uh, uh, festivals. And uh, he had also a, a projection light system where you could see some of this. Uh, the shadows and uh, you can see uh, this beautiful uh, uh, imagery. It was presented as well as at the Inter International Lunar Conference we organized at ESTEC with some of the Russian pioneers of lunar exploration and some of them preparing with us this Russian uh, ESA lunar lander mission for 2019. Um, so they reacted to the piece actually. We put them in contact with the first reaction of our Russian colleagues. We are going to fix the dome, and we are going to. <laughs> and uh, when they they, um, uh, and they they invited to eventually have a, also a display of that in a future event in Moscow. So uh, this was shown the, um, also at various other occasions. Now um, the allegory was also about freedom and uh, loneliness uh, in, in space, and uh, as a as you presented by an artist. This is another work 
uh, ghost footprint by Thais van Tijlingen. So it's just a footprint on the moon. In order to do that, um, he, uh, he asked me, oh, can you procure me 10 uh, kilograms of uh, lunar soil? I would like to do that. Yeah. <laughs> 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 yes, that would be easy. And so eventually, I gave, I gave him a, a sample and said, well, that's what has the closest to lunar dust. I had some, um, some rocks that, uh, uh, from Hawaii, basalt, that we crushed into powder and we spread this powder on the surface. And then he put a boot uh, print on it and illuminated uh, on a grazing incident so that we can see the spread. So it was also very, very nice and light. And uh, but he, he would like very much also to run this experiment on the surface of the moon. That's what he does. Um, so this uh, project actually already for this year program, and uh, uh, that's, uh, that's uh, very close to my heart because it's a project uh, by Victoria Duca Do Copolo, and it's called Non-Human Site. And for this project, she used Smart One data. <laughs> she used Smart One data, but her interest in this data is not what you see of the moon. The moon we can see. She was interested in the noise in this data. And interestingly, she's an artist. She went through the plan through our planetary uh, science archive, retrieved the data better than some of our scientists from the community do, but uh, she managed to do that, retrieve the data, and analyze uh, Analyze the data. And uh, see, maybe you have some comments on that. Yeah, well, that her question was, um, why do we why do we uh, use machines to uh, to uh, obtain only what we can see? So we have all this data, and we we, we use machines to see only only what we can um, recognize. But what happens with all the data that we cannot recognize? Mm -hmm. So that's uh, and that's a you should look at all these sources of. Uh, Noise, okay, now jargon of scientists, we call them shot noise, uh, dark current noise, and, and so But for us, it's an inspiration. So, what is beyond what we, yeah, we, we, we see, we recognize with our prejudice, what is hidden there in terms of uncertainty? And, and that we discharged. Yeah. yeah. And okay, uh, actually, this is a, uh, this is a video, huh? so, and, uh, the, the setup for uh, installation, so she has three uh, giant screens. She projects some of this uh, uh, noise uh, variation, and the public uh, is invited also to go in between and then be passed by smart one noise data. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? One of, uh, also, what uh, I remember talking to her is that why, why she went into this is that because uh, uh, all of the images that she got from space were actually really clean. And she was wondering what happens to them. What are the exact images that you get from space? And why? How do we clean them? What are the parameters? What do we then move away? What What is it that we don't see then? And she wanted to use the raw data where she has all the noise and actually to try to visualize and understand what the noise is instead of just moving it out so that we could look at this one specific thing that we want to. So that's now you made that. Okay, so uh, so that's uh, it for um, this uh, presentation. We have also uh, then a specific presentation from um, uh, uh, Katarina. And also yeah. I invite you yeah. to the poster session where I will have my poster. Yeah. Just, uh, uh, I still wanted to go very fast on uh, on uh, some it's of a yeah, on, uh, very fast on some of the other works which were produced uh, last year in the space science oh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. sorry, no. No, 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 we, we, we no. use it for no, no, no. Can I use it for yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, Okay, but to go very fast, we had a diversity of projects here, we have just presented the film. Uh, so, the dome we have presented, the uh, exoplanet we presented, but uh, also an interesting project. This was a project uh, where um, um, a magnet, uh, a series of five magnets, and we had a, a magnet that was oscillating chaotically over a, a set of the magnets with a very interesting choreography, but illustrating also how you can generate chaos even with very simple, uh, 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 simple, problems, uh, uh, simple motion. So there, we have also a very interesting project on trying to reproduce 
vortices that you encounter at the surface of giant planets. So they uh, put different devices, uh, mixing uh, different liquids, putting them in rotation uh, up to the point that they, they had a ball of glass and liquid which was hanging from the hang from a balcony from a meeting room in Aztec. So you could see some of these vortices. We, we informed the security officer of this. <laughs> uh, we had uh, also another um, a Korean uh, artist, Dori Odu. She wanted to reproduce the experience of an astronaut in the space station looking through the cupola. <coughs> so she put a cupola, projecting imaging of the Earth, scanning, but you would have just to uh, lay down on the floor with your feet up in a kind of uh, you know, macrogravity uh, simulation where your blood goes into your, your brain and uh, you could uh, then experience this. And, uh, uh, she just happened to capture me when I was trying an experiment uh, <laughs> looking uh, through the cupola. Then uh, we had also a group, they uh, tried to reproduce aurora ray. So either uh, images of aurora ray that they, they projected into an inflatable dome, and you could be then uh, completely uh, overwhelmed and surrounded by the aurora ray light, but also they organized uh, various uh, views of aurora ray. And they uh, organized as well the, um, the theatrical show where they make up an aurora. For this, they used an electron source, a cathodic TV tube, a set of cathodic TV tube, projecting a signal. Then they would trans uh, perturb the magnetosphere of this cathodic tube by putting a magnet on the back of the tube. And then they had a show where they could show the variation of the uh, uh, signal that you are uh, observing when you have a magnetospheric disturbance. Then we had another uh, colleague, she uh, did some work on the solar corona. As you know, the solar corona has different colors um, as an effect of temperature. You have a line that is emitting 2 million degrees, another 1 million degrees. And so she looked, oh, what type of material could I use to paint the corona, but with a color that depends on temperature? So then she used a special paint that is sensitive to temperature. You can, uh, you can buy it, but, uh, if you, if you uh, some, some uh, material which is thermosensitive, and then she used inspiration to uh, reproduce the corona. We had another colleague she, that uh, looked at radio propagation in the atmosphere, and, uh, and finally, we had also some sound production. And uh, one of our colleagues, is interested by what connects things in space. Every time you have two parts in space, there must be a screw. So his purpose was to see what happened in the world of screws. And, and, and then, there, um, but, yeah, and then he put a microscope there. So that's very much in short, you have uh, <coughs> some of this uh, material that is uh, being available. I propose now that we pass to the specific presentation of the project from Qatar. Yeah? Okay. So let's get to that now. Maybe I can just note that uh, Alexander worked with the screws. It, it was not actually about the screws. <laughs> it was about the industrial standards for space. He was wondering how do we decide on the standards in space and how do we then have them work together when you have them inter internationally. And then he was wondering if you want to make an input in, in this such closed area, mm -hmm. how do you do it? There is no, no space for you there. Everything is already predetermined. And then he was like, okay, then I will make my artwork in a screw. And he did nano nanoscale sculpt sculpture for the screws. Okay, good. Yeah. So now the next uh, talk. Alors, so I have a special announcement for you. As um, you know, uh, Victoria Duca Ducopulo could not make it here, so but we have described a bit of a smart one work. We have replaced the last talk by a special guest um, uh, show by uh, Dr. Bande that is going to make us a demonstration how to use Planet 3D. Yeah, so that we and so uh, and so uh, that will be in 15 minutes after the talk uh, from Katarina on speaking in light, Jupiter radio signals as deflection of light emitting electron beams in a vacuum channel. Katarina Petrovic. Uh, so, 
during, uh, during my uh, arts of, uh, space science and arts course, uh, I had a, a, my, my idea was to use the... Okay, so maybe it's nice to say that uh, I did this presentation for today's art, and there, uh, on that presentation, I tried to be as scientific as I can, and I decided to be as artistic as I can for this one. Um, because <laughs> we, we need to speak different languages at different times. So, uh, this, uh, so how did I end up uh, with Jupiter? Well, I, I was dreaming about Jupiter two days before I first came to ESA. I had a dream that the, the Jupiter was actually filling our skies and that our atmosphere worked as a, as a zooming um, a monitor. So in my dream, which I really, I don't remember seeing Jupiter and its moons, in my dream I had the Jupiter on the sky and Io on right perfect position. I came to ESA and I talked with Evelina and Dimitri about uh, a, a light, emitting, uh, light emitting electron beams and they mentioned Jupiter and the radio waves that are really uh, loud from Jupiter. And then I was like, but I had a dream about you and, the, and everything connected. This is an infrared uh, image of Jupiter on a rare occasion that uh, uh, Cassini uh, took on Mar in March 2004. And it is a rare occasion where the three moons, Io, Ganymede, and um, Callisto, were in uh, alignment. So here you see Io, the white one, and Cali uh, uh, Ganymede is the blue one, and Callisto is out of sight. So uh, let's. I would like to mention. You probably know the the magnetosphere of Jupiter is really uh, big. If you would compare it to our night sky, this would be the size of it, of on our night sky, and um, uh, it is the the largest planet uh, in our solar. So should I even say this? You know this, um, but um, it is. Uh, the most interesting part for me is that uh, during the day you have the sun, which is completely filling our uh, atmosphere on all possible frequencies. And once the sun is out and the ionization of the atmosphere stops, the Jupiter comes in. Basically, Jupiter is our night sun. And um, I was thinking about this influence, that we feel this influence of the sun very much, but do we then do we then feel Jupiter? Do we then feel the cosmic rays on us? Does whatever pen succeeds to penetrate our atmosphere? Does that make any influence on us? And uh, I wanted to. The artwork is actually uh, about that. I want to use the radio waves. I'm currently working on this. It's not uh, finished. I want to use the radio waves to deflect the electrons in a vacuum tube here. So. Uh, Jupiter was the Roman god of light and thunder. The, he was the one who grants the law. He was the, he was the justice. So I wanted to connect the many knowledge that we have about Jupiter. I was thinking, how come the Romans knew that the king of the gods was actually the largest planet in our, our solar system? Yes, they did know about Jupiter, the planet from ancient times. But how come they connected these... Um, um, characteristics to an object and to gods that actually match. He is the king of gods, he is the, the, the light and the thunder, which we have one of the severe storms in our solar system next to sun actually on Jupiter, and um, the magnetosphere is actually the, and Jupiter also has one of the greatest auroras in our solar system, so how come they connected all of this? And here on the left, you see the image of Jupiter. Uh, it's actually Zeus, because Jupiter is the, uh, the ancient Greek Zeus from Pompeii. And this is the Jupiter that is currently at uh, er um, Hermitage in uh, St. Petersburg. What I would like to mention here is that uh, Jupiter, besides being the king of light and God, and right, uh, uh, the king of the gods and the light and the thunder and the righteousness, he was also the protector of the state and the law. So uh, this is this is why the eagle, the, the few symbols that Jupiter had was the thunder, the eagle, the um, oak, and the um, globe. So.
so ego became the, the symbol for the state, which is now most of the time the symbol for any state. We have egos everywhere. Uh, his te Jupiter temple was the main temple in Rome on the Capitol and Hill, in the later Cap uh, Capitol and Hill uh, um, constellation, he was with Juno and Minerva. Uh, and um, so he was a really important god for Romans. If an emperor needs to make an oath, he does it to Jupiter. If he makes a victory, he celebrates and sacrifices an animal to Jupiter. The triumph, uh, the triumph um, gate, which the French also really <laughs> like, the Romans actually built to Jupiter. You, these are the Jupiter gates. Um, so, what about astrology? Then that's also ancient knowledge. Galileo Galilei uses it. He is referring to characteristics of Jupiter planet in uh, astrological terms when he writes about Jupiter in his um, um, Stary uh, meetings. This is the translation of the. This is the first written piece about uh, the observable sky that he made in 1610, which was funded by the Medici. And which is really, really nice is that he called the the uh, the Galilean moons that we called call them today. He actually called them the Medici moons, and he did that just to honor his patron, but also because the the uh, his patron has had a Jupiter at the mid skies in his astrological chart. He was at the direct influence of Jupiter, so he wanted to honor him with Jupiter. Uh, calling the moons by his name. So my idea is to take the radio waves, amplify them, and show that they actually influence something on Earth with light, right? So in, when you have uh, an, an electron, um, uh, uh, electric current in a vacuum, you of course excite the electrons, they emit light. This is the cathode ray tube and the work from Namjoon Pike from 1965. Uh, this is the first first works uh, that ever experimented with this because the uh, Crookes tube or vacuum tube with an electro, uh, electron discharge um, is actually the cathode ray tube. He was experimenting with the deflection by magnetic fields. This is a really strong magnetic that he put on an old TV that makes the, these patterns. There are many other works and there are some uh, in current days that um, like uh, Karsten Nikolai's work, but um, okay, so I wanted to kind of do what he did, but I wanted to have this light completely ob observable from all three dimensions. So I used um, um, a vacuum tube, Telstron tube with a low amp emission be uh, because otherwise I would be radiating my public. Um, <laughs> so I've, uh, this is an antenna which is actually the half of the wavelength of the, of the um, frequencies that actually penetrate our atmosphere and get to us, which is 20 megahertz and they are 15 meter, meters long. So the wave that is coming from Jupiter is 15 meters and in order for this antenna to actually get some really nice data, it has to be at least half of the wavelength. So it's basically six by seven meters. And I've made it, uh, and now I'm currently testing and trying to listen to and see and understand what I'm listening. This is the uh, receiver. Maybe I should just note that once I have the signal, the signal is amplified and then fed into the Helmholtz coils that are then inflicting the magnetic fields to this electron beam that is perpendicular to the electron beam, then uh, deflecting them and making a sphere. So in dependence of the strength of the signal, the more of the deflection of the um, light. This so is the a, the, the comment this receiver, as a true artist, she saw the delete component by component in the office. Huh? <laughs> yeah, they say it takes nine hours. No. <laughs> <laughs> it took me two weeks. Okay. Um, so this is the antenna. The first installation, the first mounting of it, it is on the ground of, at Estec. Then we, 
a golf yeah. golf course. Then this is right under the office because uh, we wanted to experiment to see if we could actually capture the Jupiter. It's really that time now to listen to Jupiter. And this is why I didn't make it to finish because it's in conjunction with Sun and right now it's just moving in front of the Sun. So right now we can only see it and listen to it and from 4 to 6 a.m. in the morning. So we wanted to test this constellation when the Sun is still down but Jupiter is maybe above this building so maybe we can kind of get a bit of Jupiter there? And we did, a bit. I don't know what I got yet. <laughs> I'm working on that. So these are a couple of photos from, that, from working. Jupiter, yeah. Yeah. And this overnight session that we had uh, around the before 7 U UT, which would be 9, which is exactly the point where Sun uh, uh, went, uh, arose from this building. This is exactly that jump and you can feel it, uh, you actually, I have the data that that actually, that we kind of made it there. And uh, so the, I, I took this one uh, spectrograph that I made and it is a burst that I got. I'm now looking into it. It sounds more that it is a solar burst. I was really hopeful it was Jupiter. And it was scheduled to have a ELA type of burst. I was like, hey, but no. Uh, so this is a close-up of this. This is uh, so this is the spectrograph of the analog signal that I got, the sound, and the, this is the the jump in the signal as well. Then the the audio signal is completely saturated. I can't I can't analyze it anymore. This is the that close-up, um, and. Um, for the end, I have one picture of my first testing with the tube, but you can't see it because it's really dark and it's a really fine electron beam. Uh, it's this is in UV light, but maybe just maybe. Wait. It's there. Yeah, I have a laser. So it is a really delicate um, uh, installation, and I really like it to be delicate. You know. <laughs> so we invite you when uh, she has installed it to be a dark temple. So thank you very much. Yeah, uh, you. <laughs> so we just have a time for a short question before we get uh, to, if you can start to install the presentation, uh, Brian. <coughs>